skew again, you can't get a better picture, but look at these ones, these fantastic curves, these vertical plates, and you can imagine people doing a PhD just calculating the stress on these curved plates. <laughs> and that would be it, just if it survives for the few days you've got past. How do you differentiate? You have a basic wind turbine. You have the same generators as everyone else, the same blades, the same tower. What makes it different? Well, yeah, add color on your tail, <laughs> call it a butterfly, <coughs> make it look like a 1930s aeroplane. <laughs> but if you look very carefully, with a tower that's bent like that, you can't turn that turbine very much before the blades will hit the tower. That's why towers normally come straight down, because the blades have a fair chance of missing the tower. Mm -hmm. And you can add on top of the billboard. You can choose your colour, it fits in very nicely, and no one will probably complain. It might be noisy though, I don't know. I have fought XL for some <coughs> weeks in fact, trying to get it to put some smooth curves through this graph. I've failed. Hence, we just have dots, and I apologize for that. What I've done is I've taken the rated output power of each turbine, divided, divided the power curve by that rated power to normalize to one, the maximum power, and plotted versus wind speed. Because I'm thinking, if you're trying to compare, how good is that technology? How do you compare? Everybody gives different figures. Well, let's just follow the Xs. It's a Zephyr. Zephyr. A Zephyr is a Chinese-made copy of an American wind turbine called the Air X. And it comes up here, comes up to here, dives down here, and then slowly increases. Well, that looks to me that it furls about here, but it doesn't furl completely. But as the wind speed comes up, it still increases. But that's a pretty reasonable protection. 50 meters per second is getting up, is cyclone level. I don't know if that's 150, 160 kilometers per hour, maybe 170. So that's pretty good. But let's have a look at this one, the VP extractor, which are these little lines here. It comes up here and then continues to about here. We look at this tile that comes up here. No, it's not the one. Where's the one? Where's the super wind? I'm trying to follow these square ones comes to here, it comes down here. So there are two that flatten out. And they have adjustable pitch plates. They're the only two. And it is frustrating, I can assure you, if you have flat batteries, it's blowing a gale, and your wind turbine has turned off for its own protection. That is frustrating. So having these variable pitch plates is great. It's going to cost you five times as much. What about <coughs> per square meter? So that's the area of the blade, of the scoped area. How does that vary? Well, that varies hugely too. That's a British-made wind turbine, 4 gen. That's the loop wing from Japan. So these are up there, and then the rest <laughs> sit down here somewhere. We expand it a bit, and we see again there's an awful lot around here. So this technology has not matured in the commercial marketplaces yet. What about, what sort of wind speeds should you expect? Well, we have minimum wind speeds. Some manufacturers claim less than one meter per second wind speed they'll generate. But that's useless. The amount of cost to get so little energy, you might as well just turn a handle every time you walk it past or just swing the brake. That's the sort of energy we're getting from here. So most sit around three meters per second. Okay, you'll get something from there. And then a rated wind speed, usually around 10, varies from six up to about 12, mostly. Some are around 20. And a survival wind speed, some are mostly around 30 to 40 meters per second. That one, it's interesting, I put the figure of 100 there because the manufacturer said no upper survival wind speed. <laughs> it's interesting, it has variable pitch blades. I would have thought it will still crack at some point. So I've summarized them here. But you've heard most of it. That one is important. How 
heavy, should you have a wind turbine so you can erect it? Because most of these small turbines are income in a box, and it's up to you. You have a one A4 page instructions, and you put it up. Without a crane, without, without uh, pulleys, etc. And I know that that torque <coughs> is approximately the maximum that two men can do, because we nearly dropped it. Okay? So if it's going to be a six minute tire, higher than 20 kilos, you're going to need to think how you're going to put it up, or you're going to have a bigger team of men to do, men to do it. Cost range typically is a dollar to three dollars a watt. 20 to 100 dollars a kilogram. Now, why that big variation? Because some are lighter. You can have the same nominal wind turbine weighing 30 kilo kilograms or 1.8 kilograms. Now, that's interesting. That gives you a much higher dollars per watt uh, per kilogram price. Again, a big variation in what road and cross sectional area, but this is the sort of most of the wind turbines in that area. Blade efficiency is generally not great, about 16 to 30%. 16%, yeah, you and I can make one of those. 30%, we have to think of it. But what I found frustrating as a potential buyer for some of these wind turbines is when they don't have a power curve, you don't know what temperature range it's going to operate over. See, with global warming, we're getting higher temperatures. I was surprised some, a couple of years ago to have burnt out a turbine controller until I realized we had 160 km per hour winds. It was 46 degrees Celsius in the shade. That means 75 Celsius on the box. So we were really pushing it and it burnt out. Maximum power point tracking would be nice. Several Chinese manufacturers and one American claim they have it. Notably, they don't say how they do it, so I'm suspicious. We had a student competition, and international one, we had 11 teams. Not one of them had one that worked better than getting rid of the maximum power point tracker and connecting it straight to the battery. That was by far the best of them all. So it takes some doing. I'm surprised that some of them can do it so cheaply. But ideas continue to come. Okay, you have plenty of cloth some limited welding skills, you can make something that turns. You can put a spiral blade on. It's beautiful to look like. In fact, your eyes just go round and round like that. But it's not efficient, because you're going to get these spiral bits interfering with each other. You can tell that, because it's barely turning. It's just going around like that. It's beautiful to watch, but I don't think it'll generate much. This guy started a company. He has one shaft, and he puts lots and lots of blades on it. It goes up to, I think, 20 meters long. I have no idea how he turns it into the wind. And claims it has superb output. Well, it will if you have enough blades over 20 meters. That's the B-wing one we've seen already. But that one is different. It's a microwatt, milliwatt generator. It has a, a strap here. When the wind blows through it, it shakes up and down. He has a magnet on it there, a couple of coils. And he can run his radio, he can run the lights. It's demonstrated. It's now being made in, I think, Honolulu. That's interesting because often you get places near the coast, you've got a breeze, and you just want a little bit of light. This could perhaps do it. We will talk more about this young man in due course. In a famine in Malawi, he built this wind turbine on his own. Some of you will know. In the end, if you don't have energy, it doesn't matter how badly it works. If it turns and generates something, actually, you've done better. And as a global society, if we hadn't taken that approach, we wouldn't have electricity today, we wouldn't have roads, we wouldn't have telecommunications. Who could have guessed 50 years ago we could each have our own portable mobile telephone? Not even believable when the research started on it. Thank you. Do you have any questions? 90% of all high quality magnets come from China. 90%. 90% as I understand. And that has started to have an impact. The, the specialized materials from China, I've heard recently certain ones have had an export ban put on them to Japan. I suspect the Chinese economy can no longer produce enough for its own needs. 
and therefore they're starting to restrict the output. I think that's what's happening. The Chinese uh, industry is producing large wind turbines now over, over megawatts, several megawatts, in a variety of uh, designs. I think they are a serious manufacturing and technical challenge. They have some advantages like being able to work more cheaply and having some excellent engineers, I would say. So it will be a challenge. But overall, the advantages of small turbines, you can put them most places where you can't always put large ones. For instance, the PV solar rooftop projects allow you to put PV panels on your roof and generate back into the grid. The nice thing is, you're generating where you're using the energy. So you don't need big infrastructure. So I think they have a role, but different from the larger turbines. All very hungry. <laughs> Perhaps I could add a comment to that, Peter. I think one of the difficulties of that size turbine is that you can't buy good generators cheaply because there's no other uh, industry, <coughs> no other product that requires <coughs> so they're not mass produced. Well, they are for general turbines in China now. <laughs> well, that's got, okay, yeah. possibly there's mass production and mass production. Yeah. One question is that. That uh, flammable wind turbine, yeah. do you see the application of that turbine in marine or in lake where upon wave comes? I think it's problematic. <laughs> Particularly when one of the manufacturers says that if the wind blows hard, how it regulates is the blade goes too far, dips into the water and slows down. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's intrinsically less efficient. You've only got one blade mostly doing the work any time. You have times when both blades are doing nothing, when they're reversing direction. And most of that area is not being covered by the aerodynamic effect of the blade. So I think it's interesting. I can't really see the application for it. OK, we've gone through an interesting solution. Okay. So we have seen so many uh, designs okay, that we have collected. So what are the basic materials that have been used? Okay, so the materials used, the wooden ones, are also the aluminium or uh, metal ones? Also. Nearly all fiberglass. Some small ones use plastic. Some might use wood hidden under fiberglass, but they have, don't tell me that. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'm not sure. Okay, but then. some aeroplane propellers do that. Okay, so in that case, so most of them are not uh, using uh, timbers or wooden ones. Okay, so in that case, so in our early presentations, what we saw that, or what we just came to know about uh, developing knowledge is that, so they were just uh, proposing, uh, so suggesting us to use wooden tim or timber, uh, timber materials where they have to go and study for temperature, so what will be the temperature, what will be the lighting condition, okay, what will be the moisture. So in that case, is it the only reason that, is it only the cost factor that has made us think on uh, using timbers or wooden instead of using all these designs or all these other materials? In case of those countries. Cost factor is significant um, because fiberglass in places like Nepal is expensive, supplies are irregular, and the quality of what comes in is questionable. It varies. Having tried fiberglass blades in Nepal, but timber is good as well. If you have fiberglass manufacturers available, as they are obviously in China, then naturally one would think of fiberglass. But if there's not a large production of fiberglass products, then it's certainly worth looking at timber. Timber is still used for small airplanes, widely used. There are aircraft standards for timber for aircraft blades. And David's work and our own work shows that they are exceptional. Let me give you one example I don't know, this is a personal example, but it makes, makes a lot more sense. When my wife was pregnant with her first son, her normal weight was 74 kilos, and she put on 20 kilos and sat on my lap. And I could not stand it for more than 10 seconds. Now, our wooden blade took 93 kilos before it broke. And that, that blade had been out for one year on the turbine, in the sun and the rain, it had water damage. You could, I could put myself plus 30% or well, my pregnant wife on that blade and it would sit there. Most fiberglass blades, I don't think, will match that. 